very dramatic. Hello and welcome to ICANX 25 and happy mid-autumn festival. Uh, we have a, a terrific holiday program for you today. Uh, before we get started, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Paul Weiss, a uh, nanoscience professor at UCLA. And I want to thank Alice Yang of Beida uh, for organizing these talks and uh, putting all the uh, technology together uh, to bring the world together. And also, I want to thank uh, my graduate student, uh, Chuan Zhen Zhao, uh, who's here uh, assisting me uh, as we uh, go through today's program. So we'll start with a talk by Professor Jillian Buryak, who I'll introduce in a second. And then we'll have a panel uh, with uh, Professor Carl Beringer, who will give our uh, second talk today. It's my very great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor uh, Jillian Buryak, uh, a terrific scientist and friend. Uh, she, Professor Buryak holds the Canada Research Chair of Nanomaterials for Energy and the Alberta Innovates Industry Chair of Sun Powered Generation of Fuels and Power. Uh, she's currently an Associate Editor of ACS Nano and was our Award Lecture Laureate for the Americas for 2019. Uh, she also served as the Editor-in-Chief of Chemistry and Materials. She's not only an extraordinary award-winning scientist, but one of the world's top communicators and evangelists for nanoscience, chemistry, and material science. Her work focuses on the insightful design and intelligent control of materials synthesis and assembly, materials for energy, including work on polymers and on silicon. And you're in for a real treat at Professor Buryak. The floor is yours. Yes, yes, Paul. Thank you so much. And let me just say to everybody, uh, Happy holidays. Just going to start. And thank you very much to all the organizers and, and a particular thank you uh, to Alice. So she's been just a spectacular organizer behind the scenes. So thank you very much. Alice, sir, is everything okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, Shishi. So I, it's my great pleasure to tell you today about uh, some of the work that we've been doing on self-assembly on surfaces. And this is going to start uh, with an ACS nano paper that we published back in 2008. And it's going to end with one that just appeared uh, in the last 10 days. And so first, I just want to tell you about the people who are the driving force behind the science. And this is the work of Chang Jin. Uh, he defended his PhD in 2017, and he's now uh, a staff scientist at a local startup called Applied Nanotools in Canada. And as you can see, Chong is it's quite a diverse character. He's uh, extremely good in the lab, um, but he also loves to lift weights. And believe it or not, he also runs marathons, so he can do both. So that's that's th those are two pieces that normally don't go together. I also wanna thank Eric Luber. So he's an engineering physicist in the group and he actually does uh, uh, circus acrobatics. And so um, we'll often do these uh, for charity. And so he risks his life because underneath here, there's actually, there's actually nothing uh, protecting him. So uh, he's, uh, he's also a diverse character. I also like to thank Brian Olson. So Brian actually has two more of these little guys. Uh, so he's a, a father of three and he's our coder and statistician. So he's uh, extremely good at, at um, coding and uh, analyzing so much of the data that, that is produced, particularly through the machine learning approaches that I'm gonna be telling you about. And lastly, I wanna thank Guy Shani. So Guy Shani was on the, on the junior national basketball team of Sri Lanka. So also extremely gifted and is on maternity leave right now. So um, also a diverse person and personality. So I thought just with a, a brief overview of lithography. And so if anyone is using a computer, which is, that's a joke. So er, you are carrying around some of the most uh, incredible uh, pieces of, of electronics that are based of course, upon pieces of silicon that have been, uh, that have been uh, carved out through something called lithography. 
And so lithography is, is the means by which all the complex features on chips are produced. And generally, of course, it's photolithography. So photolithography is the single most expensive cost factor in computer chip manufacturing of all the pieces along a processing line. And so when you look at what's called the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, and it's now called the International Roadmap for Devices and Systems, is that you'll see something in there called directed self-assembly. And the idea is, is that you use molecules and polymers or materials that contain the chemical information and so that they do the hard work of the lithography for you. You don't rely on having to make smaller and smaller masks um, in order to do that patterning. And so the, these roadmaps, uh, which you can go and look up, these are great places to look. If you're ever looking for ideas, you have to write a scholarship application, you have to write a grant application, and you're living and working at surfaces, these are great places to look because you can go and look in the chapters and particularly the, the lithography chapter, and you can find some of the direct challenges that industry needs to solve in order to make self-assembly a commercially viable process. So in the roadmap, it talks about using directed self-assembly as a quote, innovative technology. Now we use the word innovative as a compliment generally. Oh, that sounds very innovative. But really what this means is that this is the language used by industry to say, hey, we think this is pretty, pretty good. This is pretty cool, has potential, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so this is a challenge to academia, direct challenge saying, hey, we think that you should work on this, but there are these challenges that need to be addressed before we can actually use this, bring this into a clean room for large scale manufacturing. And so uh, directed self-assembly as an innovative technology could be used to solve nano patterning challenges for lithography for both traditional architectures. And by traditional, I mean what you're using right now and non-traditional architectures, uh, defect tolerant architectures, uh, new types of, of arch architectures for new types of computing technologies. So here we are with lithography. So everyone of course has heard of Gordon Moore, who's the uh, chairman emeritus of the Intel Corporation and, and some of the corollaries. And so Moore's, Moore's law, which um, most people have seen, of course, that you've got the, this plot that was originally published in 1965 by Gordon Moore. You have the year of introduction on the x-axis, the number of transistors per chip on the y-axis. And as you can see, of course, this is exponential. So you're going from 10 to the three up to 10 to the nine number of transistors per chip. And as we all know, it's been a, a, a remarkable three, four decades in which uh, the number of transistors per chip has been increasing by about a factor of, or doubling by about every 18 months. And so that's been exponential growth. And not only has that, that trend persisted, but in fact, it's even been a bit higher. So you can see up here that we are uh, moving faster than, than what had been predicted by Moore's law. But there is a corollary that is suggesting that that physical limit is being reached. And so when you look at the number of transistors per dollar is that we have reached this plateau. So photolithography has reached what's called a limitation of cost is that for every dollar, you're not getting more transistors is that that's because making those feature sizes smaller and smaller um, on a unit basis, they're actually costing more. So uh, there is this limitation of cost. So that's before we reach the actual physical limit, we've reached this limitation of cost. And so the idea of using molecules and polymers to do the hard work for you, that could be very inexpensive because we don't really have to pay them. So the idea is, is that you start with a block of polymer, which is just a plastic. And so with a block of polymer is the example here. Um, and there are of course many, you're just limited by your own imagination. And luckily the macromolecule uh, people, the macromolecular community, the polymer chemists have of course for many decades been busy uh, making an amazing array of molecules that we, I, I'm an inorganic chemist, I'm not a polymer chemist, but we can actually make them ourselves or we can buy them even and use them. And so, and this has been amazing that we can access this literature and say, I can do this, okay? It's almost, almost cookbook. 
So in this case, we have a polymer with one chemical composition here shown in red, and it's holding hands covalently with another polymer shown here in blue. And so these two have different chemical compositions. In this case, just as an example, so this is a polydimethylsiloxane, PDMS, and the blue block here, just as an example, is polystyrene. And so uh, in this case, these two blocks are actually pretty chemically different. And so normally if you would try to mix them, you would have some phase separation. But because these block of polymers are having to hold hands, they don't have a choice, they're stuck together. And so uh, they will, uh, under the right conditions, they will undergo self-assembly to form more complicated structures because of this covalent linkage. And so even though these, these two blocks under certain conditions don't really like each other, the fact that they are stuck together means that they will then form these nanoscale structures. And so there are a few important parameters and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about them. So don't worry about them too much. But some of the things that you as a materials chemist can or a materials person, or even if you're not a polymer person like me that you can tinker with, you can play with the degree of polymerization that's looking at the molecular weight basically, or how many units there are in these polymers. You can make them long and short with, within some degree. Uh, you can make one block longer, one block shorter, change their composition, and even make them more complicated to form more poly, poly block copolymers with more than two units. Another thing that's important is the volume fraction. So that's the ratio of the red to the blue. And then what's really important is something called the Flory Huggins parameter represented by the Greek letter chi. And that tells you something about how different the chemistry is between these two blocks. So the more different the two blocks are chemically one from the other, the smaller the polymers can be in order to undergo phase separation. If the two blocks are very similar, then those polymers have to be very long in, our, in order to force that or bring about that nanoscale phase segregation. If they're very different, then they can be quite short. And that allows you access to smaller features. Okay, so that's your crash course. So that's all, it, that's all we need to talk about in terms of the block of polymers themselves. Now, the beauty again that I refer to about all the polymer chemists and the work they've done is that we can, we, and I say we, just me, a non-polymer person, can go to these what are in essence phase diagrams and look and say, hmm, I'd like to form this structure. I'd like to form this phase. How do I do that? Well, you can just go to these phase diagrams and access whatever you want. And so just again, our block of polymer uh, noodles, here you've got block A and here you have block B. And just by changing the ratio of the size of A to the size of B, or maybe more accurately, the molecular weights, is that you can make things that are they have these, um, these cubic pa packing um, motifs or these hexagonal packing of cylinders, these, these gyroidal structures that are interconnected, these lamellar phases. And then as you get heavier and heavier in block A, you then form the inverted versions. And there are other ones too. You're not just limited to these. And so then you can look up these phase diagrams and you can see here, this is the ratio of one block to the other block from zero to 1.0 and then looking at the chi parameter. And you can say, wow, I'd like to have the lamellar phase. Well, I just need to be in here, L. Or I'd like this cylindrical phase. Well, I just need to be over here in C. So this is really great so that we as non-polymer chemists can actually use these as maps and say, oh, I'd like to make this, and then you can. So this is, this is a wonderful thing that, that's available to everyone, to all of us. And the theory is well described. A lot of the theory has been modeled beautifully. And so it's actually pretty straightforward. Now, of course, there's always the artisanal aspects of it, but it is almost that easy. And so what we're doing here really in essence is that you have your bowl of noodles and the noodles contain the chemical information that they then use to undergo the nanoscale phase segregation, the self-assembly to form whatever um, is, is chemically encoded in their composition. So it's great, they do the hard work for you. Okay, so you don't actually don't have to do that because 
you just they they do the self assembly. And so just very simply, again, you can form quite the range of structures and patterns. But just a few examples that have been of interest to the to the semiconductor industry. So three examples of block of polymers where we've changed the ratio of the blue block to the red block. Again, we're being chemically agnostic here. So we're not defining what the chemistry is because we're just being very general. So if you have the blue block being very small is that, and then we only do self-assembly in two dimensions, basically not three, we're not making thick uh, blocks of materials. We're making very thin monolayers on a surface about 30 nanometers thick. And in this case, because the blue block is very small, you end up with these hexagonally packed spheres. And then what you can then do is use this monolayer of these hexagonally packed spheres and use this as a template for further etching. And so you can then do some chemical processes and then carry out anisotropic etching of the underlying semiconductor or material. And then you then form a pattern that matches that of the parent block of polymer. And so if this is done in a high fidelity way, then this, this pattern, this information is then transferred to the underlying surface. Here you have an example with cylinders. So these are horizontal cylinders, again, just a single monolayer or in this case, these cylinders are actually vertical. And then you use these again as templates. And so you, you then can carry out an anisotropic etch. And in this case, if assuming that the rates of etching of the blue block versus the red block and etching into the underlying semiconductor, this will give you these lines or wires. Again, these single dots. And the idea is the same with, with the lamella type structures. And so again, the advantages this is a bottom-up process, self-assembly. So the chemical information is encoded in the molecules. They then undergo that self-assembly, and then you, you can use that as your template for etching. So bottom-up, that seems pretty easy. And it could be theoretically high resolution, as low as five nanometers, assuming that you can get these molecules, these block of polymers, to undergo self-assembly as they get smaller. Uh, you could then imagine large-scale patterning. And of course, in the very beginning, I showed you a big, massive uh, single crystal silicon wafer. And the idea is that with large-scale patterning, you could literally pour your block of polymer over the surface, assuming you can make a layer that is uniformly thick over the surface of that piece of silicon or whatever semiconductor or material you're interested in, is that this would allow for large-scale patterning completely done in parallel. The molecules just do the work for you. And then that leads this uh, to a very good economics profile be low cost. So that's the example here. So lines, dots, and then other things. And so you can see this in, in terms of some of the work that's being done by the hard drive industry, because that's been the most obvious extension of this work or application, I should say, is in hard drives. And so that's why you have the world's largest semiconductor, or sorry, um, hard drive manufacturers uh, using this technology. So the idea is, is that, so in conventional uh, uh, magnetic media, you have about uh, one terabytes per inch squared. And so if we had our bit pattern media, you could potentially increase that. And so Seagate, this paper in ACS Nano, you can see the example being is that we have these uh, periodic hexagonal array of dots, and that you could then with some of that directed self-assembly I'm gonna to talk to you about in a second, is that you can then use the self-assembly within some guidelines that you've put on the surface. They're either topological or morphological, or, or you use chemotaxi to be able to direct some of this, of this self-assembly. And if these are magnetic bits, of course, this would be great for um, hard drive manufacturer. And so some of the work we've been doing in, in the group has been looking at taking these block of polymers and, and then turning them into functional material. And so since the polymers themselves are simply carbon-based, I mean, they're organic molecules, uh, they, don't, they don't really, I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about organic chemistry, but they only contain carbon and then the related light elements. You can't really do that much electronic, electronically interesting things with these themselves. And so we convert them into other um, elements. And in this case, we've converted some of these cylindrical block copolymers into platinum. Now, 
the cylindrical block of polymers that I showed you a couple of slides ago, I showed you beautiful arrays. These are just schematic cartoon images of these lines of cylinders on a surface. And I showed them aligned, but that's not really what happens. When you put the molecules with the block of polymers on a flat surface, a large flat surface, the polymers don't see any, they don't get any directional um, guidance from that surface. So they form what are called fingerprint patterns. Now we've converted these, those cylinders into platinum so you can image them. I'm gonna show you in a minute how we do that. But they've been converted into platinum so you can image them very easily with scanning electron microscopy. But this is a high fidelity uh, transfer. And so uh, this, is, this is an accurate image of what the block of polymer look like. And so again, fingerprints, it's like, Okay, so if you want fingerprints, that's fine, but you're really only getting short range order. So the center to center spacing of these lines is about 36 nanometers, but there's no long range order. And this is the atomic force microscopy image of, of these structures. So the way that we convert these block of polymers is that we look at what chemical handles are available in the block of polymers themselves. And so in this case here, we've chosen a block of polymer that's made of polystyrene and poly two vinyl pyridine. Here's the chemical structures down here. So again, we, we took this from the macromolecular literature. We didn't have to come up with this ourselves. We could even buy these polymers. You can buy them from Polymer Source um, in Quebec, Canada. And so these uh, under the right conditions, you give the molecules, the polymers, the chance to undergo self-assembly. And in this case, they'll form these poly two vinyl pyridine cylinders within this monolayer of polystyrene. So chemists, we say, okay, what can we do with this? This is just, you know, these are just organic polymers. Let's go and convert them to something interesting. So in this case, we said, oh, poly two vinyl pyridine. All right, that, that is a potentially a binding group to a metal center. It's also a base. So what we, what we did, and I'm gonna show you the actual data that shows that this, this in fact happens. But what we found is that if we expose this, this uh, monolayer, this, this polymer that had self-assembled to uh, dilute aqueous acid, is that the polyvinyl pyridine would get protonated to form polyvinyl pyridinium. And this formed this very charged um, block of polymer surrounded by this neutral uh, hydrophobic polystyrene. And it would undergo a massive volume expansion because of all this charge repulsion. And so this, if it has to go under a volume expansion, it can only go one direction, and that's up and out. And so it actually forms these mushrooms, looks like uh, um, these mushroom-like structures. I'll show you AFM images in just a second. And so at that point, the polyvinyl pyridinium is exposed to the world. It's like, oh, we can actually do something with that. What we then do is that if we would like to convert this to a metal, for instance, is we choose a metal complex that is anionic. So it's negatively charged. So we've protonated the polyvinyl pyridines here. So they become polyvinyl pyridinium. And if we choose a metal complex that is anionic, then you have electrostatic attraction. And so that metal salt then um, binds via electrostatic attraction, just positive and negative, to the polyvinyl pyridinium block we then carry out a 30 second, just simple uh, plasma clean. The plasma clean uh, removes all of the organic polymer and also reduces the metal salts to metal zero structures in a high fidelity way on the surface. And, and frankly, I, this, it's been more than a decade that we've been doing this and I'm still amazed that this works so cleanly. I mean, it's so easy. You simply use a simple bench top plasma cleaner just a standard one, nothing special. You can do it in the nanofabric and just do it in your lab. And it, in 30 seconds, you have uh, beautiful nanostructures. And so here's the actual proof that those, those pictures I showed you of the mushrooms are actually what you see. So here we have a 30 nanometer thick layer of the polystyrene polyvinyl pyridine. It can be <clears throat> poly two vinyl pyridine or poly four, <laughs> four vinyl pyridine. <clears throat> This is a, again, 30 nanometer thick layer. We've undergone the self-assembly. And what you see is the most boring AFM image in the world. So this is your height image, this is your phase image. You see nothing because all you're looking at is the top polystyrene. Now, if we take this layer and expose it to HF, just dilute HF, or if you wanna be a little safer, 
dilute HCl for 20 minutes is that you see that fingerprint pattern emerging. You can actually do um, AFM movies. You can see that in the, in the original Nature Nano paper. So you see that those polyvinyl pyridine blocks become protonated and undergo massive volume expansion, pierce the top polystyrene, and there is your fingerprint pattern. At that point, your polyvinyl pyridinium is exposed, and then we can do simple ion exchange with whatever metal we want. You want to convert them to platinum, use an anionic platinum salt. You want to convert them to cobalt, use an anionic cobalt salt. Gold, anionic gold salt, aluminum, iron, whatever metal you want. You can then convert these polymers into, into a functional material that way. And so this allows you then to uh, do some more interesting things if you give the surface uh, some topology or some chemo, some, some chemical information that helps to guide the block of polymers. So I showed you fingerprint patterns before, and that's a flat surface that has no chemical information or topological information. The block of polymers just do whatever they want and they form fingerprints. In this case, we have a piece of silicon in which we've etched 30 nanometer deep trenches. We used e-beam lithography to do it, but you could use anything. You could use photolithography if you wanted. In this case, the block copolymers actually decide to self-assemble, they decide to self-assemble within these trenches. And we've converted them to platinum here again, so you can image them. But the lowest energy configuration, the equilibrium structure that forms is one that follows the walls of these trenches. And that's because that is uh, the most stable or the lowest energy configuration. And so this trench is in fact 100 microns long, 0.1 millimeters. And so you can follow along with scanning electron microscopy and you can see that these lines are uninterrupted. If you etch a 30 nanometer deep triangle in the surface, the block of polymer doesn't actually form the, the triangular type structure. It actually decides to self-assemble off of one edge of the triangle. In this case, these are two slightly different circular trenches that we etched into the surface. Again, 30 nanometers deep. And so you can see in this case, this is like a dog catching its tail. It forms these concentric rings. And here in, in D, this is slightly different. This was a reproducible defect as a result of a defect in the, in the mask that we used for electron beam lithography. There was a slight bump here. And this bump actually was sensed by the block of polymer as it was undergoing self-assembly. And so what happens is that instead of forming the concentric rings, this kind of target, is that you actually form this yin-yang in the middle here. And you add, this is formed uh, as a result of the self-assembly leading to two separate strands. And you can see one end here and the other end down here, which lead to the yin-yang effect. So these are in fact two wires of platinum that do not make contact with each other. And so this is, this is reproducible. And, you, and so you can see that the self-assembly is very sensitive to very small changes in uh, the morphology. So it's very sensitive to that. So it can be used actually as a way of being able to read out uh, for little defects. So here's an example of self-assembly with this polymer. So this is polystyrene. Uh, polydimethylsiloxane, the one I originally talked about. So we have a polystyrene block and a PDMS block. And so it's hard to see, but if you look closely, what you can see in here is that these are hexagonal dots of silica. And so this, this polymer contains all the chemical uh, elements needed to form this pattern. So previously we had polystyrene, poly two vinyl pyridine that was all carbon with a bit of hydrogen and nitrogen. But in this case, uh, we have silicon, which is embedded, of course, within the PDMS block. And so when we do the self-assembly, we form a monolayer of this particular block copolymer. And then we carry out that simple plasma etch is that when we remove all of the carbon, the silicon stays behind as silica. And so the, the center dots of this hexagonal pattern of the polystyrene, polydimethylsiloxane, uh, those, those silica dots arise from the PDMS block. This is taken with a helium ion microscope. And so a, a HIM image or helium ion microscopy image allows you an amazingly large field of view, substantially larger than a scanning electron microscope. 
And so this is an ideal instrument for imaging these types of interfaces. And this is just the fast Fourier transform. And you can see if you look around the edge that what I'm showing you is a perfect single crystal of a two-dimensional crystal of this particular block of polymer. So a three micron scale bar. Now, this is not the most, this isn't the most fair way of being able to share this data because what I've obviously done is I've all, we've zoomed in, although this is a very large field of view, this is a very large grain. This is, this is an outlier. This is a big, perfect grain. I haven't shown you on the edges over here, the defects or the grain boundaries between these, these two-dimensional crystals as they form. This is what happens on a big flat piece of silicon, this is the native oxide cap silicon, is that in different places, you have growth of these two-dimensional crystals. So they grow, they grow, they grow. And then at some point as they grow, they're all isolated. They meet in the middle somewhere and they had no contact with each other previously. And so they're not aligned. I mean, maybe coincidentally a small number are aligned, but of course the vast majority are not. And so where they meet, they're like, whoa, what's happening here? And so at that point you have these defective boundaries or interfaces and I've cut those out. So this is something that we see in the literature is of course people uh, truncate or cut their scanning electron microscopy or the helium ion microscopy or atomic force microscopy images to not show you that. But this is a question you should always ask is, what's happening at the boundaries? Where are those edges? Show me what's going on at, at the edges. And to be fair, one should always show those because that's where some interesting things happen. And it can tell you also some information about how that self-assembly is occurring, how the nucleation is occurring, and then what happens when those two grains or crystals impinge on each other. So in this example, I haven't shown you that, but I will in a second, I promise. Now, it looks pretty great, self-assembly. Wow, you know, these molecules look so easy. You know, they can do the hard work. But the reason why that uh, directed self-assembly hasn't been adopted by industry and may not be for this by the semiconductor industry may be of interest for other things, and I'll tell you about that later, is that the trouble arises when the polymers become small. And of course, if you want to make smaller and smaller features, you want to make very regular patterns, 10 nanometer, 5 nanometer periodicity, you just go and make your polymer smaller, right? Easy, just use a smaller polymer. So, eh, not so easy. So in this case, we have polystyrene, polydimethyl siloxane polymer of a given molecular weight. And so the way the community simplifies this is they just put the molecular weight of the two blocks uh, separated by a hyphen. So in this case, for this particular block of polymer, it has a spacing represented by the letter L of 24 nanometers. And so this is saying that the center to center spacing of these dots is 24 nanometers. Looks beautiful, pretty hexagonal. I don't see any defects course, the defects have been cut out of the edges. But anyway, the periodicity looks great. There's your chi parameter. That's telling you again about uh, the chemical differences or the, this really the segregation force between these two blocks multiplied by the molecular weight. Now, in this case, we've chosen on the right a block of polymer that's a little lighter. So again, the same composition, but instead of it being 13.54, uh, 13,500, 4,000, it's 7,000, 1,500. This, the average spacing is 12 nanometers and your, your segregation force is, is substantially less. And if you look at this pattern, you're like, oh, that's not great. That looks pretty messy. You would not call that ordered. So while the average spacing is 12 nanometers, it's looking pretty messy. Now, for some applications, that's just fine. You don't need perfection. You don't need that perfect order. But for a hard drive manufacturer, yes, you do. And so there is a problem. So when the block of polymers become smaller, the problem is as they become smaller and smaller and smaller, that segregation force also drops. And so at some point, you make them continually smaller. And what you then get is just isotropic mixing. They just mix. So at the physical limit. So this is an issue. It's hard. It's actually a hard chemical problem. 
So how to make them smaller. So people like Grant Wilson, he's one of the associate editors of ACS Nano, and Mark Hillmeyer, the editor-in-chief of Macromolecules, they've been interested in making uh, block of polymers with, with two very, very chemically different blocks in order to increase that segregation number. Um, and it's a hard problem. So one thing that we tried uh, was, was kind of a hack, okay? This is where we took an equilibrium structure and then we hacked the problem is that, so in this case, what we did just re represented by this schematic is that we started with a monolayer of a block of polymer that formed those, those cylinders on the surface. And that has a spacing of, of L. So the center to center spacing is L. If you choose a bilayer, so in this case, you have a, a layer that is almost twice as thick. So the cylinders up top in this bilayer, you can see that they, that they, that they lie above the interstitial space between the bottom two. <clears throat> it's kind of like if you have rolls of toilet paper on their side, they have this interstitial space and then the next one would lie above that. If we then do that metallization that I showed you earlier, we metallize and then we treat with plasma, is that what happens is that the layer above this cylinder falls between the two cylinders on the bottom. And so here you have a natural spacing of L and in the resulting pattern, you have L over two. So you've actually decreased that spacing by a factor of two, but you're still using the same block of polymer. So by using the same block of polymer, one that, that will form, at, that is heavy enough to form a perfectly ordered pattern, I say that very carefully. In this case, you've decreased the spacing by a factor of two without having to change the polymer. So you don't undergo, you don't see some of that more randomness that you see with the smaller polymers. And so this actually works. And so with a caveat, I'm gonna tell you. So here you have a block of polymer that's formed. Um, this is polystyrene, poly two vinyl pyridine. It forms single lines on the surface. We've converted them to platinum. Down here, you can see these are the double structures. So here represented in red, that's the spacing of the parent block of polymer. And these are the same block of polymers here. And so you go from the spacing of L to L over two. Now, one thing I wanna emphasize is that you see the bright lines, those are the cylinders that are closest to the surface. And then it goes, you see kind of a dimmer line. So it goes bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim, represented here, red, green, red, green, red, green, is the dimmer lines are the ones that arise from the block of polymer cylinders that are higher up. And so as those underneath, during the plasma treatment, as those fall to the surface, they actually broaden somewhat. And so this bright, dim, bright, dim pattern, in fact, is a result of the scanning electron microscopy images that higher things just end up being brighter. So here's a tilted SEM image. You can see in the original paper, the atomic force microscopy image that, that also backs this up. So this, the spacing of the parent block of polymer is here to here to here, that's your L. And then the second layer that falls in between is here. And so we decrease the spacing from L to L over two. It also seems to work with dots. And so when we form block of polymers, again, these are platinum dots of a single layer. And then we have a double layer is that it seems that you can actually density double these dots as well. So this, uh, this density doubling seems to also work with uh, silica lines that have we've drawn on by e-beam lithography. So this is called graphoepitaxy. So we are using uh, features that we have drawn into the surface graphically. And that in this case, you can see the, the silica lines. They have been drawn on using an electron beam lithography with an HSQ precursor, which leads us to these silica lines. And you see this long range order, instead of it being kind of random, is that you see the alignment along the silica lines. And you can see that, that motif that, we, that I showed before where it's bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim. And that's because uh, you have the, the taller lines and then the flatter ones, the taller lines and the flatter ones. So it's not a perfect fidelity uh, patterning strategy. This is just a corner of a very large circle that we drew in with e-beam lithography. This is the original silica lines. And there again, you can see that density double pattern with that motif, the taller, sharper ones, platinum lines, 
and then the flatter ones, the taller, sharper, and then the flatter ones. But we have decreased essentially with, again, with a caveat, the spacing of the block of polymer by factor of two. So kind of works, but it's not perfect. And so we thought, well, if I know that it's more complicated to uh, increase the number of steps in any process, but this is still fundamental science. So as a proof of principle, we wondered if we could form more perfect density doubled and density tripled patterns. And so in this case, this is a block copolymer formed from polystyrene polydimethylsiloxane. Again, this one contains all the chemical elements, all the elements needed to form uh, the patterns that we're making because the PDMS has the silicon, which then forms silica when we carry out that plasma treatment. Now we didn't know whether this would work at all. So we put down a monolayer of the polystyrene polydimethylsiloxane. We then carry out a solvent vapor annealing, which gives the system the time and the energy in order to undergo that self-assembly. We then plasma etch the film to form the silica dots that I've already shown you. And then we did the next step. We said, let's take the same block copolymer and let's form a 30 nanometer layer on top of the silica dots we just formed. Would these silica dots have any interaction with the block copolymer over top and direct that self-assembly and tell that block copolymer how to align itself would this block of polymer align itself in a commensurate way with the underlying hexagonal pattern? And so if it does, it would form this hexagonal uh, honeycomb pattern. And then if we then undergo a third self-assembly process, would this then form a triple density film okay, or pattern? So uh, in fact, that seems to work. You put down the first layer and represented here in blue schematically is your, is your periodic pattern of hexagonal dots. So this is just a plan view, top view, scanning electron microscopy image. This is a tilted view. Here's your second layer. So this actually magically worked is that the block of polymer, when we self-assembled on top of this first layer of silica dots, is that it did, the self-assembly self process did try to align itself with the underlying dots. And that turned out to be the lower energy configuration and you see the resulting honeycomb pattern. And then the question was, would the third layer then uh, align itself with this honeycomb pattern? And so here you can see the green and the blue dots representing the first two self-assembly steps, the third layer represented by the yellow dots. Would they uh, align themselves so that they plunk themselves right in the middle of the honeycomb hex hexagons? And it turns out that they do. Now. The human eye is very good at picking out patterns. I mean, that's part of the reason why we survived is that we could recognize the difference of tigers in reeds. Is that just the reeds blowing or is that in fact a stripy tiger uh, hiding behind the reeds? And so the, the humans, of course, who could identify those patterns were the ones that survived. So we are, we are very good at pattern recognition. And so it also is very pleasing. You can see the pleasure sites in the brain light up when people look at patterns, it's, it makes us happy. But that can also lead to bias. And so what, what's very important that we thought is that you need to be able to quantify quality. You can't just say, wow, that looks pretty. Wow, that's really periodic. That's really ordered. That's very qualitative. And going back to the international uh, roadmaps, so the ITRS, the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, and the one for devices and systems, the newer one, is that they have all called out specifically the community for not having enough quantification of the, the patterns that are formed. They're saying, okay, you keep showing these pretty patterns and you keep cutting out the, the nasty stuff on the edges when you publish this. Um, and you don't even have a way of being able to quantify what quality is. And so, Brian, so remember earlier, Brian Olson, he's the one with the three kids. He's our statistician and coder extraordinaire, is that he designed, uh, wrote an algorithm or, or code or an application that would then take these scanning electron microscopy images and find the overlap and determine the overlap between dots. And this is really important, for instance, for the hard drive manufacturers, because if you then go and convert these into magnetic dots, if you have magnetic dots that are overlapping, that's a problem because then your two bits are in fact one bit. 
So in this case, this, this pattern down here uh, in the top, in the top right or top left, it looks pretty. But when you go and put this in the code that Brian wrote, is it represented in blue? The blue dots are showing you the dots that are overlapping. And so he's actually looking at the colors here representing the deviations from perfect hexagonality. And out of that, you can then derive the number of dots that are overlapping. And you can see it's 17%. So just a pretty picture isn't enough to be able to quantify what perfection is. And so you can see in this, for this particular block copolymer, is that represented in blue, you see the scattered overlapping blue dots, that has 6% overlap. Or this case in the bottom left-hand corner has 9%, or the one here in the bottom right-hand corner has 3% overlap. So our eye is fairly decent at being able to pick out uh, imperfections, but really I, I wouldn't have the one that's 17% and 9%. I actually would have said, oh, that 9% doesn't look that great. But if dot overlap is important to you, and which it is if you're interested in making hard drives, um, in fact, the 9% is better, even though it doesn't look as good. So we needed a very quantifiable way of, of determining what quality is. And so you can then go and do a lot of data because this is, you can feed the entire scanning electron microscopy image into the app and to be able to pull out the statistics necessary that allow you to make rational improvements. Okay, so 3% overlap. That's still not that great, um, but it allowed us to be able to go and rationally improve. But one thing that we, that Chong Jin, so Chong is the guy who was lifting the weights. What, what Chong Jin asked was a question that kind of surprised us. So he did this, he did this without you know, saying anything, um, which, which is absolutely great. So he put down that first layer of dots, like I showed you before. But instead of putting on another layer of the same block of polymer to make the density doubled or density tripled structures, is he put on a second block of polymer with a different spacing. So he chose a different one. And so he said, what, what's going to happen? So that block of polymer, the second one, has a different natural periodicity, a different spacing. Is it going to try to squeeze the dots together to try to match the underlying polymer? Or is it just gonna make a mess? I mean, really, what's it gonna do? Make a mess. And so what he then did was he annealed it and then etched it and he formed these structures which are Moiré structures. And then Brian, again, who's our coder extraordinaire, wrote an application that would separate the top pattern from the bottom pattern. So just to, and then you can put them together. And to show you this is real data, if you look in the bottom right corner, here you see three fat dots. You can see them here uh, in red, and then you can see the three small dots, and you can see them here in blue. And what the what by separating them, what we were able to do was to determine what is in fact going on. And so you can see the top structure uh, is the spacing does not change to accommodate the, the spacing of the bottom. It decides I'm just gonna do what I am designed to do and I'm gonna form this periodicity and this spacing. This is what I do. And in order to try to minimize the energy of the system is that it you form an angle of rotation. There is in these incommensurate lattices, it decides to rotate to form these Moiré super lattices. And in this case, it's three degrees. And so by separating the top layer from the bottom layer, it allows you to determine that. Now, when we started, we had no idea what we were doing. So we have we chose three combinations of block of polymers. We just happened to have them around using Brian's uh, application. We could separate the bottom layer and the top layer and then determine the angle of offset of these two uh, lattices uh, that are forming these Moiré super lattices. And in this case, for these block of polymers, they decided to form a 30 degree offset. This is an 11 degree rotation offset, in this case, three degree. But we had no way of being able to, to determine this. And here is a helium ion microscopy image showing you um, one grain. And this we call um, our flower motif, but that's not very technical. It's not telling us very much. Here's the fast Fourier transform. So I did not tell you the whole story in which is that, that there are defects. And so again, remember I showed you people will often go and, just, and cut out the defects of their images. And so you can see, and I had done that too. So here you have the triangular pattern. Here we call a flower pattern. There's a triangular pattern again. There's a grain boundary here. And so what Brian did is that using the 
helium ion microscopy image is that he was able to do a Google Earth image. Now, I'm not sure whether this video is going to, how it's going to come out. Okay. So you can actually look this up in the 2017 ACS Nano paper, uh, if you'd like to look at this um, a little more closely. And what you're seeing here is that Brian fed these images into the algorithm that he wrote that separates the top layer from the bottom layer. And it determines that angle of rotation and then this allows us to be able to get global st statistical analysis of the rotation. And so here you can see those grain boundaries that I told you about at the edges. And so you're gonna have grain boundaries of these two dimensional crystals because you have isolated nucleation over this very large area. And as those crystals grow and grow and grow, they meet each other to form uh, grain boundaries of those crystals. So I can see a little bit of a lag here. So, um, but the point is, is that you can then take this data and do statistics. Now, what this is showing you here is that most of the pattern is in fact, what we call that triangular Moiré super lattice. Now I haven't, I'm not proving this to you here cause I don't have time, but it's in the original paper. But for a given combination of block of polymers, you actually form what's called a majority phase. So that means that one, that almost everything you see is in fact the majority phase and that these little defects that you see in the, for instance, the blue and the orange, the flower patterns are minority phases. Those are happening at boundaries, green boundaries. I'm just gonna skip this over because it's a little laggy and get to the very last part of the talk today. So I'm just gonna wait for this to catch up. So I'm gonna show you, I'm just trying to get out of this still showing the movie it's going to take a while yeah it's kind of trapped in the movie there i wonder if i can get out of that i'm going to exit this to see if i can make this stop because it will just take too long no it is stuck there See if I can play it again. Yeah, um, I seem to be, it seems to be trapped in a endless loop here. I think this movie was just a little big. Um, Alice, is there any way to stop the, stop the Okay, movie? I think you can play the escape. Yeah, to see that it can be stopped there. Oh, you stop okay. sharing? <laughs> okay it's oh it's almost done i can see it's almost done now sorry okay. about that everybody uh, it's beautiful so we like to see okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think there we go i think this is going to exit in just a second it is it is a hefty amount of data i mean it's pretty impressive that we can actually do these these conferences this is coming from Canada to China and then out to the world. So it's actually pretty impressive that we're even doing this. Just waiting for that to catch up. Okay, so over that surface, I can see what you what everybody is seeing. You see these, these domains of the two dimensional crystals with the grain boundaries between them. I'm still waiting for that to, to catch up. Come on, it's still thinking. The next picture is that picture of Chongjin, and then I'm gonna wrap this up. There we go, okay. So what I showed you looked pretty messy, that last picture. So we have these large areas over, that was a 30 micron by 30 micron helium ion microscopy image. So these, these were pretty large grains, but it still looks pretty messy. And so we Chongjin asked the question, are these in fact even forming uh, majority phase or are they just simply messy? And so we wanted to generate statistically relevant data that could properly analyze these and also to be able to maybe have some predictive power uh, and build a library for machine learning. But we didn't even know whether that was possible. So what Chong Jin uh, decided, to, uh, decided to try was um, to uh, carry out electron beam lithography. And so he, instead of using the block of polymer to draw that first uh, pattern on the surface. I can see it's still a little laggy here. 
So Chong Jin decided to come up with a way of using electron beam lithography to draw the first uh, hexagonal pattern on the surface instead of just relying on the block of polymer because electron beam lithography allows us to change the spacing by very tiny increments. So we could go from 12 nanometer spacing to 14 to 16 to 18 to 20, all the way out to 70 or 100. And then, oh boy, we've kind of gone back and forth. It seems to still be sort of stuck in that. Come on, come on. Maybe there's a boat going over the, over the cable in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or something and it's slowing it down. Just waiting for that to catch up. There we go. Okay, so using electron beam lithography to draw these pillars would allow us to make a uh, 2,800 templates of these block of or, or sorry, these hexagonal rays. We then do the block of polymer self assembly, and then feeding it into Brian's algorithms allows us to generate a huge amount of data. And so these are just some of the circular posts uh, drawn by uh, electron beam lithography. Still waiting for it to catch up. Yeah, it's a little laggy now. I probably shouldn't have shown that. Uh, still, I can see it's still thinking. Sorry, everybody. Still thinking, still thinking. So again, uh, 2,800 templates later, maybe it's thinking about each of them. I can see it's still thinking. hoping that this will come through. You know, I wonder if I should just leave the presentation mode. Okay, there are the arrays of dots and posts. So this is a five micron scale bar, so you can't see the actual uh, dots themselves. And I'm, I just moved slides forward to show you one. So I don't want this to take too long. So Alice, I think I'm going to leave the presentation and move to see yeah, if that okay. helps. You can do that. Yeah. Yeah. See if that helps. And I'm just going to move through and kind of get to the end here because I don't want this it's to go. It's updating right now. Here. I can see the next one coming up. Oh, you can? Yes. Okay. It's about to show up. Okay. Just gonna wait for that. Luckily we're almost done, yeah. Still a little slow. Okay, it's coming. Not sure why it's laggy. But anyway, this is just the world in Zoom. So when you have the hexagonal array, you then um, can, do the next block of polymer self-assembly, and you do form the Moiré structures. So here's an example. This is a subset of 35 of the 2,800 structures. Of course, I'm not going to go into any detail. I know people are probably looking at their screens going, I can't see anything. But the point is you see the Moiré structures everywhere. And, and again, feeding this into the algorithms that Brian wrote is that uh, we then were able to analyze all of this data and do uh, proper statistics on it all. Now, the one thing that surprised us and where I'm going to wrap up in just a second is we saw throughout something called static distortion waves. And static distortion waves are formed when the system is actually trying to further lower the energy of these two-dimensional crystals when it's undergoing this van der Waals epitaxy. So I'm still waiting for it to catch up. I think it's still trying to process that movie. There we go. And so an example here in the scanning electron micrograph on the left is that you see the Moiré structures, but if you then look at the rotation, the angle of rotation, this is a colorized image that Brian had done where he's looking at the rotation of the lattices is that you see these spirals. You see the green spirals in one direction and the, and the pink spirals in another direction. And these are in fact chiral. And these spirals are just local distortions of the system trying to minimize the energy. And so these are called static distortion waves and they kind of remind us of a Van Gogh painting. And so uh, 
the static distortion waves form as the, syst as the system is trying to undergo these uh, decreases in energy to decrease the global energy of the system. And I see it's still a little laggy. I'm trying to always be a couple of slides ahead. There's your Van Gogh painting. And then we'll be done with the Van Gogh painting. And so these small distortions in energy have actually been predicted uh, way back in 1977 by Novako and McTagg when they were working on graphene surfaces. Now you say, wait, graphene or graphite surfaces, I should be more specific. Graphite is, um, that's all new. That's just all, you know, Nobel Prize stuff, you know, from, from the 2000s. Well, people have been working on, on doing crystallization on graphite since, since the 70s and even before that. And this, this had been predicted as a way of being able to decrease the local energy um, back in the 70s, but was only seen in 2016 in an ACS nanopaper by Fritz and, and co-workers that I'm about to show you. So as soon as this catches up, I can see my arrow. Trying to stay ahead. So the idea is, is that with these molecules that self-assembled on the surface, these are small uh, ring-like flat molecules that self-assemble. So this is the first experimental, um, experimental proof that these happen, is that when these molecules self-assemble on the surface, there are very tiny displacements of the carbon-carbon bonds that are, when you look at them, you can see these static distortion waves. Now here represented in red, this is the table of contents image on the right-hand side, is that these have been extended by 15 times because these, these distortions or these stretches are so small. These are carbon-carbon bonds. They undergo very small displacements. But what we find in our system is that they, in fact, uh, work on the uh, tens of nanometer scale and that this could serve as an interesting model for these static distortion waves in a very tailored way that are very easy to observe. And so I'm just trying to get to the end here as soon as it catches up. And so what's happened is that this has turned out to be an interesting model for graphene bilayers. And so this has become a very exciting area of research, uh, these twisted bilayer graphene structures when you have one layer of graphene on top of another and other two dimensional materials as well, not just graphene, is that when you twist them to form uh, these small angle rotations or offsets is that they can have very interesting properties like uh, magnetic properties, ferromagnetism, people are seeing superconductivity and that these twisted layers, you're also seeing local distortions that are basically static distortion waves. And these static distortion waves are leading to very interesting properties. Also seeing um, that these static distortion waves or these incommensurate patterns are of use for other types of materials as well, related to organic electronics and super lubricated surfaces. And I'm just going to, so in this case, for instance, these Patterns that don't quite match, like the ones I've been showing, are turning out to be very interesting for super lubricated surfaces and for organic electronics interfaces when you have one crystal interfacing with another one. And so I'm just going to exit and then get to the end. So these models, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna dare show another video. I was gonna finish with a video where I show uh, the models how we developed a model that shows how these static distortion waves um, appear, but I'm just gonna go straight to, straight to a summary in just a second. So with those 2,800 structures that we form via e-beam lithography is that we saw the static distortion waves everywhere. These patterns are, um, turns out to be very common. Uh, again, predicted in 1977, only shown experimentally in 2016, and that they may be very important for these incommensurate type patterns for these two dimensional materials. And so what I would like to finish with is that I apologize for the technological slowness there. I'm sure that was my um, fault on my end, is that these 
self-assembled block copolymers can be used to access a wide variety of patterns and that you're not limited to the patterns that the parent block copolymers form. That equilibrium structures, uh, they can be hacked, like I showed you in that density doubling type motif, that instead of just being stuck with the pattern that you um, that a particular block copolymer will form, you can actually double them. You can expand the repertoire of patterns. And that beyond applications, the self-assembly can, can, be, can be an interesting model for other types of van der Waals epitaxial structures. And that these static distortion waves are in fact very common, uh, much more common th th than we thought. And so I have to thank, of course, the people who did the work. And so in the next picture, you're going to see this is uh, self-assembly. As soon as this comes through, this is self-assembly of dumplings. This was uh, before the pandemic, of course, because we're sitting together. We had a dumpling, uh, Chinese New Year, dumpling self-assembly line. This is Chong Jin, uh, you know, because he's in the gym all the time. He needs uh, to eat a lot. And so we had our dumpling self-assembly line. And um, here we are uh, enjoying Chinese New Year. So I apologize for the slowness of the slides at times. Um, I'd be so happy to answer any questions. Again, thank you to, to Paul, to Alice, and to all the organizers. So, Shisha, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me get the uh, screen up here. All right. Well, what a fantastic talk. I think. Uh, you know, I've, I've uh, seen uh, this work develop uh, over the years in your laboratory and uh, it, it is both scientifically and uh, in just in, in, uh, in the images you get, uh, just absolutely beautiful. And we have a, a series thank of questions. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. We have a series of questions uh, from our uh, global audience. Uh, the first one is, in the nanoscale self-assembly you showed for the polymer, can it be done in different patterns and with localized control? This is such a good question. And so um, the in the so the international the one thing I didn't mention about the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors is that every three years um, it's updated. And so and there was an iteration. Uh, this is before 2010, where the semiconductor industry through the ITRS, the roadmap, said to the block copolymer directed self-assembly community, okay, if you would actually like this to be commercially viable, we need you to make these seven patterns, seven of them. They're very specific, some jogs, some bends, some curves, some loops. And so uh, this was Paul Neely's work. So Paul Neely, uh, at the University of Chicago, he was at Wisconsin then, they used electron beam lithography to chemically pattern surfaces to direct those block copolymers to form these more complicated patterns. And so uh, that was actually accomplished pretty quickly. Now, the problem of using electron beam lithography, of course, is that that's a serial technique, whereas the block copolymer is a parallel technique. So being able to form different patterns and with localized control, this is the crucial thing. And so what industry really wants um, and for other applications too, for instance, in biology, is to be able to use the most sparsely patterned features possible. You don't want really dense, you don't want to have to go and write really dense features. You'd like to use just a little stop sign over here or a little, little feature over here. And then the block of polymer will then do all the work for you with as few features as possible. So that's a big question. So, this is, uh, this is an interesting area of research. So whoever asked that question, feel free to email me with, with, uh, with follow-ups if you like. That's a great question. Terrific. Our next question is, uh, thanks for your wonderful talk. For the multi-layer assembly, in principle, if the dots or lines become smaller and smaller, can it reach the atomic scale? And also, does the temperature affect the results? Good question. So one of my, my former graduate students, uh, Jeffrey Murphy, he went to go do a postdoc in 2017 or 16 with um, Dick Brewer, who was the former vice president research of Philips. And so Philips in the Netherlands in Eindhoven. And so what they did, so this was, th this, this I thought was just super. It's great when you see your former students doing just wonderful things. 
is that Dick Brewer's group, uh, he had, Dick had been uh, head of the light emitting diode, the, uh, the LED uh, work at Philips. And so they did a lot of work with uh, liquid crystals. And so what Jeffrey did is that he did directed self-assembly of, of very thin layers of liquid crystals on surfaces and that they were able to make sub five nanometer patterns using the liquid crystals. So uh, that was actually generating periodicities of three nanometers because you're looking at the self-assembly of really surfactant molecules, not of large block of polymers. And so that was great. Now you're asking atom level. That's okay. That's I understand that this is a this is larger than what you're talking about, but um, that was the closest that I had seen. Now people are doing beautiful things of of, of epitaxial self assembly on graphene and things like that. So maybe when you're thinking about the atom level, and for instance, Paul Weiss here is an expert at this. So if you are thinking about, for instance, small porphyrin molecules self assembling on uh, a graphene or other flat surface is that really you are, if you have, for instance, a single metal atom in the middle of that porphyrin, that's, you are doing self-assembly with those at the atomic level. So these are all using the same principles and they all are part and parcel of the same thing. So, and does temperature affect the results? Oh, you bet it does. And so uh, if you're, you have to give the system enough energy to overcome um, the the uh, uh, the activation barrier of mixing, and so and to allow the system to find the lowest energy configuration, and so that's really important. But what's interesting is that you can kinetically trap interesting and non-equilibrium structures um, by by fooling or, or playing with with the temperature. So that's really interesting. You can do all sorts of quirky things. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Uh, our third question is, uh, what's the most exciting physical phenomenon or property you find in moiré superlattices that make the moiré materials different from others? Such a good question. Um, so again, the moiré superlattices, we did not set out to find them. They, they found us. And so um, one thing that Guy Shani, so I didn't have time to talk about her work, and this is this is unpublished, but it's coming out soon, is... When I talk about this to audiences that have a lot of expertise in plasmonics, is that they all ask, can you make metal nanostructures of those? And can you make the top metal different from the second metal? Because, you know, we've done modeling, blah, blah, blah. So um, she's been making structures that instead of it being just boring silica, uh, for instance, they're gold and platinum or gold and silver or gold, gold, platinum and silver, things like this. So the the plasmonic properties of, of the mixed metal structures uh, appear to be pretty interesting. So we're working with some of the plasmonic modeling people in order to uh, to understand the what we're seeing from this. But I think what what's from a fundamental perspective is that these moiré super lattices they are much more interesting than just pretty pictures, and that you're seeing that in the two dimensional. Uh, two-dimensional van der Waals structures, the, the graphene examples, for instance, and that they have their own set of properties. And so I think this is just the beginning. Thank you. And our next question, uh, the block copolymer patterns have to be formed with two pattern nanoscale features using techniques such as electron beam lithography. Can block copolymer patterns be transferred to another surface? Can we replicate and transfer these features using soft lithography? That's really it. <laughs> great. At least we practice. Yes. We could probably break it up further, but we'll, you can go A, B, C, and I'll leave them up on the screen if you're able to able to read them and work your way through them. I'm so excited that this person asked about soft lithography. So uh, please have a look at, uh, we have done that. So uh, 2015 paper in ACS Nano. 2016 paper in chemistry materials and the most recent in, in ACS applied nanomaterials. So what we did is we did block copolymer self-assembly. We converted them into metal and then we smeared PDMS precursors over them and then you pull them off. And so at that point you have the block copolymer pattern in a soft lithographic stamp. And then we then use that as a plasmonic stamp so we put it on top of another surface and use the plasmonic, uh, the, the electric fields generated uh, when you 
get a localized surface plasma on resonance with those gold nanoparticles to, to then pattern surfaces chemically using that. We've also formed catalytic stamps. There's a JAX paper from 2008 that we had where we did use these, these uh, use the block of polymer derived metal nanostructures in the PDMS stamps to, to induce local catalysis on surface. So yes, so that, that, that's, that's something that, so that was, um, uh, Cheng Cheng Rao's work. Uh, he just defended his PhD last week, and that's something that he's been working on. So yes, and I think that's great because then you're separating the block of polymer uh, lithography from specific surfaces. You can then have a stamp that allows you to surf to pattern anything. So yes. Fantastic. And then our uh, fifth question uh, for multi-layer assembly: What can you say about the interactions, connections, and drivers? Uh, between different layers this 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 is this is such a profound question and uh, unfortunately the video it wasn't wasn't working um but in order to be able to answer this question because it to be able to to make some some rational statements about how the underlying pattern is 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 directing the self-assembly of the pattern above it you need these physical insights and the only way that we thought we could best uh, derive these insights is through modeling. And so we used the LAMP software and we then modeled the hard uh, silica dot features underneath with, with the mushy uh, block of polymer self-assembly with a pseudo Leonard Jones potential. And so we have these movies and you can see them in the ACS nano paper that came out last week. It's in the SI. Um, you can watch as we model this as it undergoes the annealing and reaches that equilibrium structure. And then from that, from that computational model, we were able to pull out all these interactions and the model actually matches what we see pretty nicely. So that gave us the physical, at least as a starting point, some of the insight, insights into what in fact is holding these things together, what in fact is directing them because you've got hard features, you've got soft, mushy features, you have solvent around uh, because we're doing solvent annealing. So um, yes, so some of it is, is chemical, these interactions where you have a silica surface and you have the polydimethyl siloxane of the block copolymer. So you have some um, Van der Waals type interactions there. So please have a look at the paper if you like, if you can't find it, um, it's, a, it's an ASAP. Let me know. I'll I'll direct you to that. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. And with that, we wanted to uh, well under what we'd really like to do is you know walk across the stage and thank you in person and <laughs> and give you a plaque. But unfortunately, in the current world, what we're able to do is is uh, you know certify this uh, talk and uh, let you know that we'll be sending you this. Uh, uh, the, the thanks uh, for bringing your uh, beautiful science and your insight and your enthusiasm uh, to the ICANX series. Uh, we really appreciate you know this uh, you, uh, sharing this early hour uh, with us and uh, and, and uh, uh, showing us uh, what you've developed across across time, including your, your very recent uh, beautiful work. Uh, thank you. Jia <laughs> <laughs> well, and next, uh, we want to bring out uh, Professor Carl Geringer from uh, the University of Washington. I'll give him a formal uh, introduction uh, before his talk, uh, but before that, uh, we'll have a, a panel, and I believe that we'll also be able to uh, bring out, oh, here we are, uh, Professor uh, Yan Li of uh, Beda, one of our other ACS Nano uh, editors. And uh, each week before the, uh, before the talks, we uh, go over what we might like to cover uh, during the panel. And, and this week, uh, Professors Buryak and uh, Berenger uh, suggested that we talk about the difference between hard tech or tough tech, really making things with function that can you know, change our world around us uh, versus, and the efforts that have to go into that uh, versus, for instance, you know, writing apps uh, that that we've also uh, seen uh, change the world around us uh, 
over over recent times. So uh, maybe let's start off uh, with uh, Professor Belinda Carl. Uh, let's get your uh, initial thoughts. Well, um, first of all, uh, hello and um, um, great to be here at the Icon uh, X uh, talks and uh, panel discussions. I'm really happy to uh, be here for the first time as a speaker. I'm very excited to uh, meet all of you and uh, uh, also thanks to uh, Alice and to Paul and all the uh, entire team uh, for organizing that and for Jillian to giving a really fantastic talk this morning for, well, for me it's morning in, at the West Coast. Um, uh, so uh, 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 let me uh, yeah, just say a few thoughts about this um, uh, well, difference between uh, hard science or tough tech, if you want to call it that, versus uh, software. And uh, I think it's really uh, a topic that has been uh, occupying my thoughts a lot. And I've been talking with colleagues about that because um, there's so many exciting things going on in uh, really on both sides. But uh, um, I would like to plead to everybody, and especially the students here, to uh, to look at the exciting things that are going on in material science, in, in electrical uh, engineering, in uh, all the uh, disciplines where, building, where people are actually building stuff. And I think it's more important than ever if you talk about Internet of Things, if you talk about new kinds of healthcare technology and many other uh, topics where ultimately what really matters is the interface between uh, the world and all the information technology. So what is that interface and how can we make it better? Uh, so I think we're, uh, we're all uh, working in that area and uh, there's just so much more to do. And uh, um, I encourage everybody to, uh, to look into that and say, well, uh, don't take the easy way, just uh, 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 write some apps and do some software, but actually do the hard thing and do, do what's really exciting to, uh, to build new kind of hardware to make our life better. I think we can take it as a good sign that the people who are uh, attending today are either up late on a holiday uh, in China or up very early in America or you know taking some time out in their uh, Friday afternoon in, in uh, uh, Europe, Africa and uh, nearby. Uh, Professor Buryak Jelly. Sure, thank you. So I think it's really important um, about this, the tough tech versus um, versus apps is that uh, just just as an example, I mean, I use apps like crazy. OK, so I'm not going to criticize them, but the world needs you. The world needs you to all of you, particularly early career young scientists need you to work on these hard problems. Uh, these hard problems related to energy, these hard problems related to medicine, these hard problems related to health, the environment, um, these are not going to be solved overnight. Uh, they're not going to be solved in five years. So we, we need you to, to, to work on these um, and to be inspired by them. And so please don't be, don't let them get you down. I mean, you're allowed to, 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 uh, to feel a little depressed once in a while, but use them as inspiration to to go and 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 really try to try to 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 solve them because the impact that you can have uh, in the long term will be so great and so important. And I think that that's important is to keep an eye on the long term. And maybe you can comment. And we saw that this uh, work that you did extended. You know, I I followed uh, your work and we published, you know, as you pointed out, the beginning and end of your uh, talk, you had uh, ACS Nano papers over a decade. Um, what goes into that kind of a sustained effort uh, from your point of view and in your laboratory and how you work through different generations of students and postdocs? It's the students. It's the students. And so the the only reason why we started working on solar energy back in, we started in 2006, was because the students were coming to the doors, coming to our doors and saying, I really want to work on renewable energy. And I come from a province that is very rich in petrochemicals. Um, we are what's called a petrol state. 
And so there's a, a lot of pressure and it made us on, on our students to go and work on, to become chemical engineers, to work on um, petroleum processing. But there was this undercurrent of students who said, you know, I just don't know if that has legs for the future. I'm very concerned about the environment. I'm very concerned about the social aspects of this. And so they came to us and said, please, can we, can, can, who can I work with? And we're thinking, well, there isn't anybody here. So maybe we should. And so we cobbled together small amounts of money and we put, put, uh, put together um, small, uh, re small grants as a result. And then, and then it just started, but it was the students who started that. And so the continuity of these projects, it's from the young people. Uh, it's from the early career researchers who come to us and say, I really wanna work on this. And it's great to see that passion and that love. And that's what allows these projects to continue because they're the ones who, who tell us, I think this is important and this is, this is the future. And so we, the best thing we can do is, is to listen and hang on for the ride. Yeah, I think one of the things we try and get across uh, during these talks and panels, we you know, show a series of uh, beautiful you know, data and papers, but it isn't like we walk into the laboratory and conduct a symphony. There are a lot of challenges along the way. And as, as you pointed out, putting things together at the start where one doesn't have a track record can be very difficult. And uh, Carl, I've watched your uh, science develop and your career as you uh, looked at different functions and materials and, and tried to uh, develop those and then succeeded. Maybe you can, maybe you can follow on with uh, what it's taken for you to do that. Energy of the young people again. Um, so I, I sort of feel like that the way I, I try to run the lab is, is do my best to help people focus on the problems. I mean, you can say, well, I'd like to solve the world's energy crisis. I mean, ooh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big problem. So you want to say, okay, what piece can we solve? What piece uh, do, what, what, what expertise do we have to solve these pieces? And can we bring these two disparate or separate pieces together? Because the more pieces of the puzzle you can put together, then the picture starts to become more complete. And, but, and then once we figure that out, it's a question of me making sure that we have the resources necessary to do it. And then I kind of just stand back. And if that person is, you know, has that drive and is, and is so interested in it because they, they themselves have helped to figure out how to solve this problem, really, it's just, you know, it's, it's just great for me to stand back and watch that go. So yeah, just I, nurture it. Totally um, agree. So ultimately, um, uh, working with students is just so exciting to see how they come up with new ideas and then take uh, the research in new directions. Um, uh, when I think about my own uh, career, and you know, uh, Paul hinted at that earlier, uh, so I've been maybe in a somewhat unusual path coming more from the software side, um, uh, starting out in robotics and uh, then uh, getting really excited about the possibilities of microtechnology, of MEMS, of uh, nanotechnology as well, and uh, uh, seeing what what can you actually do that is at that interface, and uh, uh, how can you actually simplify um, the concepts that you know maybe from the large scale robotics and apply them at the small scale, where uh, maybe initially it's it's very hard to do the same thing if you uh, build an articulate ro a robot that manipulates and assembles things. Um, you have at a large scale, a lot of capabilities, there are motors and sensors and um, actuators and so on. And at a small scale, you really have to be very economical. You have to be very efficient uh, with the limited uh, capabilities, but, uh, but doing that is just exciting and a challenge. And when students come in and, and find new solutions for that, it's really exciting. So going from robotics to assembly to uh, self-assembly and then to other kinds of technologies that uh, take advantage of the small scale. That has been a really exciting path for me. And um, I have to say that uh, it's sometimes really hard for the students. So they are, uh, if you do hardware, if you build things in a lab, there can be weeks or months or maybe even years where uh, nothing really works. And at, at the end, when it all comes together, it's all the more exciting to accomplish that. So, uh, so that's, I think, a really great feel, uh, feel when you actually can put something on a table and say, 
here, this is what I've built and uh, now it works. So maybe you can even take it with you when you uh, go to um, presentations and do job talks and so on. And you yeah. keep track of the things that you can't do that you would like to? <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think my advisor always said that uh, you learn a lot more from the failures uh, than from your successes. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, there were some uh, great videos that I remember actually, again, in the field of robotics where, uh, I mean, usually in the short conference videos, you only see the great things uh, that yeah. work perfectly, but uh, but if you see the long version of the videos, you see the robots fall over, bump into each yeah. other. And that's yeah. really where you see where things go wrong and what you can improve. Uh, so there's always something more that you can do to make it more reliable and better. And uh, Professor Yan Lee, uh, yeah. we heard your ICANX, or many, many of our audience members heard your ICANX uh, lecture uh, last month. Uh, maybe you can talk about uh, your uh, journey into uh, carbon nanotubes and what, uh, you know, how yes. you've uh, been able to put together your uh, laboratory and to, to uh, you know, grow what you've been able to do. Uh, yes, yeah. okay, thank you, uh, Paul. Yes, um, actually, I, I, I fully agree with Julie and Carl, yeah. Um, as a professor, we are always inspired by our students, right? Yes, for, for my joining this uh, field of uh, carbon nanotubes, actually very accidentally. I was not planning to join this field at that time just because I suddenly visited, um, I have a chance to visit a lab in the United States. That's the reason I moved to a new field. Mm -hmm. And uh, so though I, I joined this field uh, uh, accidentally, but I, stay, I choose to stay in this field for more than 20 years. That's my own choice. Um, the reason is I feel this material, this carbon nanotube, uh, so amazing material. It, it has a very, um, a very uh, outstanding uh, properties and have very good, a uh, very uh, bright, bright future for patients. And I already studied this field for so long time that uh, I fully understand the most challenging things in this field and the most important topics in this field. That's the reason I choose to stay. And also my, uh, thanks to my students, they really want to work with, uh, work with me in this kind of um, traditional already in this nanoscience field, right? Though it's, the, it's only 30 years, uh, less than 30 years old, this field, but talking to materials and um, nanomaterial um, area is already quite old, it's quite old material. But we still have many things to do. Um, yeah, yes, I, I, yeah, I, 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 yes, that's the reason I choose to stay. And I think I will continue till my retirement. <laughs> well, it's a long time ago. <laughs> And uh, maybe uh, throw it open here about, you know, especially during this time where probably if you're working on apps, you could, you know, sit at home and, and work away on them without any uh, trouble. But right now, you know, we have limits on travel and how much uh, we and our students and postdocs can go into the laboratory. So there's even an extra level of difficulty now uh, compared to normal times. Do you, does anyone have any? I regret that you're working in uh, materials and uh, uh, physical experiments. Yeah, um, yeah. My, yes. My students are now, I think they are all, they are still working at this holidays. They work very hard. That's a re one reason we can do a uh, good job, right? They, they work really hard. They uh, like, I think uh, doing research is something amazing um not only because we face those uh, challenges the other very important um attractive thing is we always can find something unexpected something really different from we originally expected that should be normally should be something really important so that's that's i think this uh, very good uh to be a scientist, 
to be a, a student working on research is, is good. It's something really good to your life and to your future. Not, not, only, not only bring you um, something um, exciting, but also make, bring you something, make you feel happy. So <laughs> that's, that's and maybe another yes. maybe another lesson is that you know we have this uh, idea that there's always uh, something exciting uh, just around the corner maybe in yes. uh, yeah 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 uh, Jillian's case it might be you know just around one of the twists in the in the uh, <laughs> layers uh, and and that really is something that gets out of bed every morning uh, and I think I think we all feel that. Uh, 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 Carl? Well, um, well, I think as a as a scientist, or well, but in in general, there are always thoughts about well, could I have done something different? Could I have something better? And um, I do remember as an early graduate student, my office mate uh, told me, "Well, I'm quitting grad school and I'm joining Microsoft," and that was in 1990. And probably in retrospect, that was not a bad career move. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, so there are uh, always choices that you make, but uh, I think it's good uh, when you think about the many good choices we have. And uh, no matter what you do, as long as you do something exciting, uh, there are always uh, good reasons to uh, to go back to the office or go back to the lab. Uh, mm -hmm. I also wanted to add, I, I think right now it's definitely a difficult time, but I guess where is the, the safest place to work right now? I think it's actually in the clean room. Uh, we have um, uh, very uh, <laughs> safe places to work with uh, air that gets filtered several times per minute. Uh, and uh, uh, all the students who work there are very well uh, trained in safe operations and um, uh, keeping, uh, keeping things very clean and uh, uh, uncontaminated. So actually my students right now, they're, uh, they're quite happy when they can get into the clean room. And besides, you probably heard that here in the Northwest we had uh, fires and uh, smoky conditions. And again, being in the clean room was the best place to be because there you can breathe clean and safe air. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there are always, always uh, pros and cons to whatever you do. But uh, I think overall, working in this field is just a, um, a fantastic place to, to contribute to science and to the society in general. Our students and postdocs have made the same comments about the clean room. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the no matter what places where we can do experiments always make us feel something good, uh, a good place. Uh, I remembered when I was a postdoc, I I like this very dark TEM room very much. Though it's dark, <laughs> white, but because I can find something exciting there, then I feel that's a really good place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, Jillian? One thing I want to stress is, I mean, the, the optimism of science is what drives us, the curiosity. But I also want to stress the students, young people, it's okay to have bad days. It's okay to um, feel like your work isn't progressing. That's okay. We all feel that. Okay, everybody feels that, and I, I worry a lot that uh, that particularly young people are putting a lot of pressure on themselves. I think the important thing to remember is that when you are frustrated, when things don't seem like they're working, that's actually when you're learning. That's when you are learning that system. That's when you are hitting the wall with the hammer, and then the cracks start to form. So it's really important to. Uh, to work with your group, um, to, that the social aspects, even if you're isolated, that you talk to each other, that you reach out, that we that we all work on this, on these things together. Because a lot of what we do, the experimentation, we do it alone in the lab, we do it alone in the nanofab. But it's it's the human side of science is what is so wonderful. That's why we have conferences. That's why we're doing this right now, is because the human side is so important. And that's how we do the best science. And so if you are not feeling so great and your project is not going, you know, you, 
we have these low times, those are actually essential to science and we all go through them and you're not alone and that we, we all understand this. So reach out, talk to people because that's actually when you're truly learning. You know, when you have a system that's really working, that's a, that's a great time, but that means you actually understand it. But the hard times are when you're actually learning. So those times are okay. We all go through those. And I just want to stress that because particularly now, it's it's not easy. You don't have to be happy every day. That's okay. Yeah, I would. Yes, I would like to add one word. Yes, if you all, if you no 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 any possibility there is only happiness. You need to have something some very difficult time, some suffering time, because of those um those difficulties those 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 things make you. Have the ability to to really feel the happiness, right? The life should be not should not be always happy, happy, happy. Then you will not you will lose the, the sense of happiness at all. Then you need to have something, some difficult time, some suffering time. Then you uh, when you finally find out some the way to uh, overcome the difficulties, suddenly you feel oh I'm so happy. That's a uh, that, that's that's a way of life, right? Maybe I can give two perspectives on that. One is from the outside, the world only sees your successes, right? It's a, a peak meter. When uh, we sh when we give talks, we show the successes in our laboratories, but you don't see, for instance, the 20 years that went into building an instrument through different uh, generations of students. And then they, from the inside, uh, what we find is having students and postdocs in our groups and laboratories is like having a family in fast forward. So your students and postdocs grow up very quickly and then they go off into the world and then they have their own students and postdocs and you're connected for the rest of your lives and the rest of your careers to this growing family. And so, you know, you have your brother and sister uh, students around you and you have your academic parents and advisors and other mentors and especially now where we might not run into each other over coffee right here <laughs> it's very important to connect in any case and to you know hear what each of us said that that there are always going to be difficult times uh but uh you know we 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 push forward and we get through these and and one of the themes of this panel was really how do you take on hard problems and how do you put together the resources and that includes your own you know resources to persevere to really get to the point where you can make an important difference in the world and so i want to thank all of our panelists for bringing that out and especially in this you know in this unusual time and again alice for bringing this group together uh, this is this has been a wonderful uh, panel, and I want to make sure we leave time for uh, Professor Berenger to give his talk and for our audience to uh, be able to uh, ask him questions. And so uh, thank you, everybody. I will uh, take over the screen again here. Okay.